This week on Back to the Movies, we're talking Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. You know, I really hate children. We're going back to the movies. 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 Movies. Yeah. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Back to the Movies, the silver screen time machine where my co-host and I travel back to a specific year of cinema history and explore what made it special. This season, we're looking at the year 2007. I'm your host, Ben, and with me as always is my co-host, Nat McGee. Benjamin Hain. So nice to see you. What is this? I I guess it's an <laughs> Olivander. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, I was like, uh, our new celebrity. There's a lot no, it's of not people Rickman. that just say his name in a foreboding way, right? Mm, well, every year, true. some some guy has to say it. God, it's so interesting that they somehow made the name Harry Potter compelling to say when it's like the most painfully generic name of all time. <laughs> but every time, you know, somebody's like, Harry Potter, you're like, oh, oh, oh yes. tell me more. Listen, we we had a great episode last week. We covered Paul Verhoeven's Black Book. It's a smaller film, a Dutch film. Not many people have seen it. So we decided that this week we had to swing big. So we're going we're going Potter this week. This is a huge episode. Um, Nothing hotter than Potter. <laughs> I love that. Is that good? Should we keep that? Yes, in? <laughs> absolutely. So we needed an assist. We needed a guest. And I racked through my Rolodex and I I think we found the perfect person for this episode. This guest is a very old friend of mine. She is an actor, she is a writer, and she's a comedian. Please welcome to Back to the Movies, Jesse Canizero. Hello. Mm. I was kind of waiting for like an applause track in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you guys do that, but <laughs> I was we like, add in all sorts applause. of zany sound effects all the time. Uh, boing. Slide whistles. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, if we're shots. doing 2007, you might as well, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go full zany sound effects. <laughs> um, Record scratch. Yeah. Welcome to the pod, Jesse. So, thank you. Happy to be the, here. You're, you're an accomplished actor, writer, Aww. and comedian. But one of the reasons we have you here today is because, well, for many years, you were involved in a Harry Potter production. Can you tell our listeners about this production? Yes. I mean, first, I must legally say that it was, has nothing really to do with uh, the uh, franchise by a certain name about a certain boy wizard. Oh, right. Uh, okay, yes. <laughs> the lawyers are always listening. Uh, but um, yeah, I was in a show called Puffs or Seven Increasingly Eventful Years at a Certain School of Magic and Magic, uh, which is about not the certain boy wizard that you are all familiar with, um, but the wizards and witches next to him in class who are trying their best, namely the Puffs, um, who are sorted into kind of the saddest house uh, <laughs> at, at, the, at school, um, but are, are kind and loyal and, and, and brave in their own right. So yeah, you've, you've lived the life of a HP, um, I don't know, adjacent. how would, adjacent, professional. yes. Yeah, yeah, it's it's tricky, right? Um, uh, yeah, I've I've certainly lived the life of uh, running around with a wand and a cape uh, and shouting spells, and that's just because of my everyday life. Uh, you know, that's just what I wear <laughs> and what I do. <laughs> and would it be too much to say that as a function of who we are and when we grow up, you were engaging with the Harry Potter culture? Oh, absolutely. I'm actually, you can't even, you can't see right now, I know we're recording a podcast, uh, but I did break out my Harry and the Potters t-shirt from, <laughs> I used to, in 2007, like 2006, I would go around to libraries in New York uh, and see Harry and the Potters play. There was like a big wizard rock renaissance, if you all <laughs> were part of that scene. I don't know if you were wizard rock, scene, wizard rock scenesters. <laughs> what was the first era of wizard rock that was then being reborn in the yeah. wizard rock renaissance? Oh, I don't I mean, well, the, I feel like the first era of wizard rock is With the wizard Led rock Zeppelin in the books. Doing oh, Lord yeah. of the Rings music. You were the Absolutely. Leonard Nimoy Bilbo song. You've yes. seen that, right? Yes. Bilbo. I love um, that song. I, I'm going to, I think we should forgo our, our what's the best thing we watched this week. Because I feel like I Harry agree. Potter just has to take over. I did watch Harry Potter movies. I watched three, four, and five. Um, Whoa, okay. In anticipation. Because That's I hadn't seen those, those other ones. But what I wanted to ask, Jesse, is... What were you doing on the evening of July 20th, 2007, 
<sighs> Particularly what, right when the clock struck. When the clock the struck 21st. midnight? Yeah. Um. Oh, boy. I'm going to have fans angry. Is that the release of the book or that the is, movie? That is the release of the book. Which... Oh, well, then, in that case, I was definitely at Barnes & Noble. Uh, okay. Which Barnes yeah. & Noble on the Upper East Side? Um, I would sometimes go to the Upper East Side, but in the last few years of the books, I was often going to the Union Square Barnes & Noble. Okay. Um, uh, certainly for for the I remember for the last release was a big one where my friends and I like really went full out dressed up. I did like a loop in half werewolf kind of costume. Jim Dale was there doing a, a reading. Oh my uh, god! Yeah, the, the Union Square bookstore, uh, Barnes what a Noble was. Scene. What it a was scene. yeah. This is I'd say this is like the banner year for Harry Potter, at least in terms of like its popularity, because the final book was coming out and this big movie was coming out. I mean, it was building steadily. Yeah. But I think this is the 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 total point. The zenith. The zenith. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly, like, uh, you know, it, it was interesting to go back and re- and admittedly, I did rewatch the movie this weekend in a bit of a post second vaccination fever dream haze. <laughs> so <laughs> I took notes, but I don't know if any of them made sense. Uh, but it was interesting to to note that like this was a transitional moment for the movies, also. Like as David Yates as as the upcoming director that then kind of took over the rest of the movies including an up to fantastic beasts so it was a big transitional moment also you know into the more adult quote unquote uh section of harry potter yes that whole scene was so like just going to those midnight releases it was like, what, about, what about you ben did you do that oh yeah i went to the south burlington barnes and noble <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> i actually wanted to ask what was the first midnight book release you guys went to because Part of what sort of compounds on this makes it interesting is the first one I went to was the fifth one. I think mine was really? too. Yeah, I think that's I think mine things... was also, yeah. I feel like that's when the midnight release really became a thing and when we became old enough to participate in that. That's the other thing too, right? Like I feel like I was like nine or ten. I mean, we were kind of growing up right around the same time as Harry, uh, or at least I, yeah. I know I, I was and uh, Nat, Nat was. We were we were in school together at the time. Ben's Ben's like what a month older than than, us, than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're all the same. Than that. Ben is fifty here. years old. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to assume. <laughs> I've actually been an old man the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think the fifth was also my first big like. Okay, I'm going out with my friends and I'm getting dressed up. Yeah, staying out till midnight. Before we begin the deep dive of Order of the Phoenix, I just wanted to call out a couple little fan engagement things. Please, if you can find it in your heart, if you can find a moment, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Can you give a five-star review for podcasts anywhere else? I don't even know. If there's anywhere else you can. You can do it on Audible. Audible? Are we on Audible? And we are on Audible. We are. Wow. That's incredible. Head on over to Yelp.com, leave a review (laughs) (laughs) for our podcast store. (laughs) I've been doing some podcast research, and I actually do think that those those reviews help a lot. Do we have a five-star review you want to shout out? I have one. This is why I know that they're on Audible, because we have one review on Audible on Amazon. Read it out. If it's good. (laughs) All right. It says, this podcast is awesome, in all (gasps) caps. Nat and Ben do such a thorough deep dive into their movies and their rapport is so fun and passionate i also love that they focus on a year of cinema for each season so unique and fun i love every episode i've listened to and would recommend to anyone who's that from what's their name that's from grace thank you grace Grace. for that review thank you very much grace um you can also follow us at bttm pod on instagram twitter and guess what we're on tiktok now that's right Whoa! i just uploaded the three videos that i had put on Instagram reels, but they're there. They're in the algorithm. We've gotten some likes already. Um, check them out. You can also email us. The email is bttmpod at gmail.com. So without further ado, Jesse. Yes. Tell us, do you have a personal history with Harry Potter? Like where, where did it start? I feel like our, our stories are going to be very similar, but we might as well hear it from the expert. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I well, as as Nat was saying that we, we we have known each other since we were five years old. We went to elementary school and summer camp together um, and worked at summer camp together. So we, we go back a, a ways right around this time. For me, I mean, I, I remember being given the book when I was about nine or ten yep. by I think the mother of a friend of my brother's uh, was like, oh, this is supposedly big now or you know in england or something they came out of no like it was it was yeah. like a thing it was just like people were like handing these books to each other in, in like hushed tones like oh did you gosh. guys have scholastic book fairs oh yeah, oh, yeah. 
Absolutely. That is where we first discovered Harry Potter. Uh, at the Scholastic Book Fair, they had a whole big display of, I think, the second book. Yeah. Was, was oh, when wow. We, we got it. Okay. Nice. And, and that was when we, we picked it up. So, I mean, so when did you become like a Potter, like, diehard? Like a nerd? Yes. <laughs> so Somebody who would go diehard. dressed up as a half werewolf loop into a book release. Someone instance. who is still wearing a shirt from 2006 <laughs> that you got at a Wizard Rock concert? Good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, I suppose it started, I, I mean, well, I was always <laughs> on the nerdier side, uh, I was super into Lord of the Rings. So it was only natural that I was <laughs> going to really find uh, a kinship with the world of wizards. I, I don't know. I was like, Right away, I, I just, I devoured the books, starting with the first one, you know? And as soon as the series came out, I mean, I, I was that kid in the front row who would start bawling the minute, like, the first notes of John Williams' <laughs> beautiful theme started playing. My mom would be like, nothing has happened. <laughs> like, yeah, but it's about to, oh, man. Uh, I just, like, I'd, and I, I don't know, I, um... I, I went to a college without a football team, but we did have a Quidditch team. Nice. Um, you know, it was, oh, yeah. Uh, God, yeah. You guys remember when, like, intramural Quidditch was a thing when we were in oh, college? Oh, yeah. <laughs> did Chapman have a Quidditch? I don't know. It did. It did. did you not know that? No. Yeah. I, it must have been in the the third division Quidditch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely not top tier. I was studying abroad in, in London when one of the, the movie releases was happening mm. and going in the rain to, like, see Daniel Radcliffe from a distance. Um, wow. I, just, I ate it up, you the know? I, yeah. It, it was a real, like, thing. specifically speaking to the movies, when the movies came about, that was a real, like, reinforcement. This is the most popular thing for an 11-year-old right now. And yeah. the, the movie, the first movie hit when we were 11. When yeah. Harry is 11, it was like perfect. It, it's it's almost unfair, to be honest. Yeah. Like how in the bullseye we were for these this franchise. Yeah, There's so much about this franchise that is so interwoven with our generational experience. You won't be able to tell the story of the kids born in the early 90s without talking about Harry Potter. The millennials. It's not just that we... <laughs> millennials. It's not just that we, you know, were the right age when they came out to experience them first, it is that we grew up with the characters and we grew up with the books. As the books got older, we were getting older. It was the way that we spent time with our families when we were kids. And then it was the way we spent time alone when we were teenagers. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's so crazy how perfectly it aligned with that. I don't think any other cultural property in history has ever achieved that or ever will. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're totally on the nose there where it's like, we were, I mean, you know, people talk about the the fifth book in particular as like, oh, Harry's such like a whiny teenager, always complaining. I feel like that's why I really related to it at the time. <laughs> I was like, hell yeah, I'm a whiny teenager too. I love to complain. <laughs> I speak in all caps locks. Where does the fifth book fall in your favorite book hierarchy? Is it up there? Is it middle? I'd say it's not my favorite. I did enjoy it, I think, more than the average reader did like i love a good room of requirement you know i love yeah. a weird department of mysteries heist uh <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of cool new stuff that they added in this one that i that i appreciated um mm -hmm. that that being said it was i remember when this came out and they were like it's gonna be 700 pages and it's everyone was long. like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> yeah it and definitely with, didn't with need the benefit to be. of hindsight yeah it didn't need to be that long absolutely not <laughs> Especially since, again, when they made the movie, they were like, well, we can cut. It was like the shortest movie at, up to that point. <laughs> we talked about sort of our relationship with, with the books, but what about with the films? Were you as big a fan of the films as you were the books, Jesse? I definitely was. I mean, it's interesting to revisit. Uh, I mean, my, my favorite of the directors is, is Alfonso Cuaron. I thought he did a, a just a, a bang up job. But I, uh, I I mean, I love them. I was just saying to my brother the other day, uh, he's going to be embarrassed that I share this story. But we were like on our way to see the final movie. Uh, and, and we got like halfway to the sixth train. And he was like, we got to go back because I'm wearing shorts and I don't want to like get cold in the theater. So I just I want to be in like the optimal, you know, outfit. <laughs> to enjoy the movie in case the theater is cold. <laughs> I've definitely had to do that before myself. Yeah, you know, I haven't you had it. anything to drink for six hours, so I won't have to I pee. Won't pee. <laughs> Absolutely. Again, like, I remember going to wait outside of TRL. If anyone, if anyone remembers TRL, Total Request Live, when uh, when you know Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson and Rupert Grint were there. I have like a pencil autograph from Emma Watson. <laughs> wow. Uh, How many times yeah. have you seen 
the three stars. <laughs> it's, I mean, that one was a little random. I think I was like walking through Times Square and okay. I was like, ah, a bunch of people in wizard hats. Sure, Jesse, sure, sure. <laughs> I believe you. There was that time that, that you uh, snuck into Daniel Radcliffe's <laughs> house and he had to call the cops, but that's fine. Look, I'm also leaving out a huge detail of my nerdiness, which is that my first job after graduating college was working at the Harry Potter Museum in Times Square, the yeah. official Harry Potter exhibit. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> My job was to sort people into their, their Hogwarts houses. Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask, what's your house? Mm-hmm. Do you have a house? It's a great question. Uh, I was sorted by the official quiz into Slytherin. Uh, I know. I know. I, I was, I, too. I mean, I oh, was really? Too. Oh, okay. Yep. Nat gave me like a faux look of shock. but No, no. That was, that was excitement. <laughs> well. I felt you know good what? About I, that. I have not taken the quiz. This is on like Pottermore, right? Oh, should we about. take it right now live? <laughs> but but I will say I self-identify as a Slytherin. So wow, <laughs> really nice. Okay, oh, yeah. yeah, own it. Yeah, there's not there's are there any good Slytherins? They're not all in the evil. <laughs> in the, in the their the ideology <laughs> is not is not is no worse than any of the other houses' ideologies. Like their their core beliefs of like you know. Doing what it takes to get the job done. Right. Of caring about success. Mm. You know, like, those are not bad things. Yeah, they just take it too far. Resourcefulness, ambition. Like It was, it was a bad batch in Harry's class. They're just definitely all a bad batch. Boot Rowling just thugs. needed villains, so she just decided that they were the villains. Yeah, you know what? There's nothing wrong with being ambitious. Like, own your goals. Own your. I'm going to turn this into a self-help motivational <laughs> podcast right now. <laughs> Believe in your dreams. Go get them. <laughs> Be a Slytherin. Nat, were you into the movies? Oh, yeah. I was there opening weekend. <laughs> I was, you know, it, it, it cooled off later on. I'd say, like, I was in the sweet spot for one. One is, like, my movie. Like, right. I've mm-hmm. seen that a million times. I remember seeing it, like, twice the weekend it opened. It was a big deal to me. And then, like, over the years, it got less and less. One is the one for me that I watch it, in, and, like, the objective part of my brain is, like, Ben, you know this movie really isn't that good, but the part of me that's still 11 years old. Yeah. It's, I know. It's well, it's the dude, it is, like, I feel like it does get a, a large amount of pushback from fans or, or you know, Christopher Columbus's direction of, of that film. But I feel like it, it really introduced this very magical, lovely world. I, I do want to go back and rewatch because I feel like I, I, I'm with you, Nat. I, I felt a lot of magic in that movie. I went back last summer and oh, rewatched no. <laughs> one and two, which is why yeah. I only had to watch three, four, five this time. And, like, yeah, one is... Not a very good movie. It's, it's kind of bad. But that first half of it with just like all those iconic moments and like you even remember the trailer yeah. and just how exci- like you can't deny it. And then two, I have no emotional attachment to. I I think it's oh yeah, it's garbage. It's so long for such a short book. Yeah. So yeah, no, I love the movies. What about you, Ben? You have a movie. I'm gonna add to my Slytherin credential here and say that I was never that big into them Not you know, like obviously you know when i was 11 and, and 12 years old i, I was and, and i and i certainly saw them in theaters but then something happened with the release of this film oh god that yeah. scarred me forever okay. yes listeners in the very first episode of our season i mentioned that one of the films of 2007 had the worst theater going experience i have ever had and ever expect to have and it was this movie Okay. And I'm going to tell oh you all about God. it. I'm us. hooked. I'm hooked. What happened? Before I do, one caveat I have to say is it's going to sound like I'm being a little mean to my mom. <laughs> so I just want to say, mom, that I love you and I don't blame you for this. And I'm sorry that I'm dragging your name through the mud here. Oh, no. That's 2007. Oh, jeez. <laughs> my mom has a hard time at the movies. She's very sensitive to light. She's very sensitive to sound. She gets motion sick easily. She gets migraines. She doesn't do well in movie theaters. And she was worse back when I was a teenager. She's a little better now, but back then she just couldn't handle it. That meant that we always had to get to the theater really early. We always had to sit in the absolute back row. And we occasionally had to like leave a movie earlier. She had to leave a movie early because she couldn't deal with the theater. When this movie came out, it was a big release. There was a brand new theater in the town where I grew up, Williston. It was only like two years old. It was one of the first theaters in Vermont to have stadium seating. It had cup holders in every armrest. I had never seen a movie theater that had cup holders in every armrest before this theater. Like, it was a modern multiplex, but to a guy from Vermont, it felt like a big deal, like a mecca for movies. It was also the most popular place to see movies in the Burlington area because it was the nicest theater. So whenever there was a major new release, it would be packed. Harry Potter was no exception. We go opening weekend to an absolutely packed house, mostly full of teenagers and college aides kids. And we're sitting in the back row we got there early because my mom's going to have trouble with the movie. 
and they start playing the trailers and the crowd's a little rowdy. And maybe because of that, or maybe just because it's a newer theater and they haven't worked out all the kinks yet or whatever, the volume on the trailers is a little louder than normal. And my mom's sitting there and it's really getting to her. And she says to no one in particular, I think I'm going to ask them to turn it down. And I'm sitting right next to my mom and I go, no, mom, don't ask them to turn it down. And she goes, no, no, I I think I'm going to ask them to turn it down. And I go, oh, God, mom, please don't ask them to turn it down. And before I know what's happening, she's standing up and she's turned around and she's waving at the booth, at the projection booth behind us, because this was still projected on film that time. And the guy opens the window and he sticks his head out and he goes, what? And my mom goes, it's a little loud. Could you turn it down? But the theater is really loud. Only a couple people have noticed at this point and sort of turned around to see what's going on. And the projectionist can't hear my mom. And so he goes, what? And then like the back two rows turn around to see my mom standing there. And she goes, it's a little loud. Can you turn it down, please? And he doesn't really respond. And he goes back into the booth. And then the sound on the trailers cuts out. Uh He mutes it. And he sticks his head back out the window and he goes, what? Oh my God. And everyone in the theater turns around to look at my mom. And in a very quiet voice, as I remember it, she says, I just thought it was a little loud. Could you please turn it down? And he kind of shrugs and he goes back into the booth and he resumes the sound, but it's so quiet. You can't hear any of the dialogue. Oh God. And this crowd of teenagers and 20 somethings loses their fucking minds. Like they cannot deal with the fact that the volume is too low. And even though by the time the movie starts, the volume has reached like an okay level, it's over. Just the crowd there. has just lost it. They are just, yeah. they, they spend the entire movie just being completely bug nuts, heckling and catcalling and shouting and just, <laughs> and I'm sitting there as low in my chair as I can possibly get. The thing that I remember more than anything else is every time that they would cut to Umbridge's office, everyone in the theater <gasps> would start meowing. Uh, just like meow 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 <laughs> oh my god oh no wow oh, i'm surprised you guys made awful. it out alive <laughs> the next yeah. week i go to school and somebody i know but i'm not like super close friends with comes up and says oh man i saw harry potter over the weekend and the craziest thing happened you won't believe it some woman stood up and made them turn the sound off and i was like oh. that's it i'm done I'm never seeing <laughs> oh, again. Oh, I'm f- i feel for your mom <laughs> oh my god <laughs> da- i mean i i am uh as as an adult i'm very afraid of teenagers uh and their heckles <laughs> they're yeah. heckling so uh I, I i feel for her i mean she's a courageous woman to stand up there <laughs> but as a consequence of that perhaps or maybe just because i was getting older i did not see another harry potter movie in theaters Wow. Until the final one came out. Yes, and I only saw you. that one because the opening sequence of The Dark Knight Rises played before it. Oh, oh. yeah. That was, that was a big draw. <laughs> yeah. This was almost wow. the end of Harry Potter, the film series. Dang. This movie. I'm sorry you had this traumatic experience. Um, we should work through that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, maybe this podcast is the first step. All right. We yeah. got to move on to the movie. Yes. As much fun as it is to just talk about Harry Potter anecdotes. Um, let's. <laughs> well, can I say one more thing about oh. what you just said, Nat? <laughs> Absolutely. When I was preparing for the show, I got to thinking about it and I quickly realized that I have spent more time in my life thinking about Harry Potter than I have about any other cultural artifact. Just as a function of how long the books were, how many there were, the movies, the video games, the whatever, there will probably never be anything else in my life that I dedicate as much thought space to as Harry Potter. And I'm not even a huge Harry Potter fan. (laughs) It's there. It is there for all of us. It is our, it is our lightning bolt scar as a generation. We got it. We have to have a way to use it. So talking about it now is so cathartic almost. Absolutely. No. Even if, I mean, listen, it's a huge cultural touchstone for me, uh, obviously, and a huge influence on my life. And then it sucks so much that I just hate <laughs> yeah. the author. Yeah, we definitely have to acknowledge no. it. <laughs> uh, oh, are yeah, we going to talk about J.K. Rowling? We don't, have to, get, we don't have to get into it now. But <laughs> All right. Let's get into Order of the Phoenix. And right. we'll start with this week's story, 60 Seconds, which we're going to call Nathaniel McGee and the Minute of Story. Great. <laughs> So good. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna that. summarize this movie in 60 seconds um, for anyone ready? who's out of context. I'm ready. Challenge round, I guess this time, Nat, is just assume you are reciting it to somebody who has no idea what Harry Potter is. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> Go. Harry Potter, a wizard, is feeling down this summer because he witnessed a terrible act of violence last year, and he's has he has a little PTSD. He gets picked up by 
some wizard cops who are trying to fight the new terrible evil wizard named Voldemort who is back. He's resurrected. Harry has to go on trial for a crime that he allegedly committed. Then he goes to school. He's kind of being a loner at school. Everyone hates him because of the trial. And there's this new lady running the school who is kind of like a fascist asshole. And eventually he bands all of his friends together to train to fight Voldemort. And they end up fighting Voldemort. And unfortunately, his only family member dies. But he comes out of this experience with a new group of friends. The end. <laughs> wow, that was, that was pretty right good. on the nose. <laughs> That was, that was, um, you should be hired by Scholastic. That was great. I, I try. I try. <laughs> it's a, I, I can't imagine going to see this. There should be like a New York Times article that's like, or eight people interviewed who went to the movies without any Having context. Having never read the books. <laughs> I That was like the first thing I thought was like, wow, they really drop you right in. Like if you didn't read the books, which I know like, I think when my mom would come like take me to see them, she was like, I don't know what is going on, but what you guys this? seem to be enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. I am absolutely sure that this movie in particular, if it didn't have Harry Potter, you know, if it was just, a, you know, everything was the same, but it just didn't have the series and the cultural ubiquity and the knowledge coming to it, it would be another Seventh Son. It would be Aragon, the movie. It would be a movie that has been forgotten to history. Okay. So I you're yeah. you're not on the on this movie's vibe, Ben. You don't like it very much? You're, you're not or vibing you? with it? <laughs> I, no, I think this movie is quite bad. Interesting. <laughs> I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't hate this movie. I didn't hate this movie. What about you, Jesse? You know, I I will say, I'm sitting down to watch it, I was like, wow, I really don't remember this movie at all. Like, it started, and I kind of thought I had accidentally put in signs. Like, we were kind of flying over a cornfield, and <laughs> yes. I was like, hey, is this Harry Potter? <laughs> uh, I, I just was, like, really lost for a minute. But um, it's, I, I didn't, going, when you said Order of the Phoenix, that we were going to be talking about that today, I was like, okay, that's a movie that I neither loved nor hated it just kind of was there for me uh, yeah. i mean again i think it was like a real transitional film it was not my favorite but not my most hated okay and on this rewatch did you find any like new admiration or was it mostly the same i did find some new admiration i you know i there were there were some shots where i'm like oh yeah we're getting a nice overview of london <laughs> we're getting london in this movie <laughs> um and uh i you know i think i think david yates did a nice job of the you know getting getting darker and grittier. Yeah, but yeah. I, it also was like too. I don't know. I I, I had a, I I think I had more problems with the movie than I did. Um, you know, it, it felt like enjoyment. Yeah, I I don't know. Just some, somehow say- like the movie. Mm, yeah, I'm I'm rambling. Basically, <laughs> I didn't love it and I didn't hate it. <laughs> gotcha. I'll say this. I watched three, four, and five. And right. three, Prisoner of Azkaban, that is like some art. I it's agree. the only great yeah. film in the Harry yeah. Potter series. That is a yeah. cool it's, movie. It's a genuinely great film. Yeah, I hadn't yeah. seen it since it came out. And like, I was like, man, this is cool. I love this. Mm-hmm. And then I watched Goblet of Fire. And Goblet of Fire is kind of a hot mess. It is. <laughs> it is. It is really There's messy. There's a lot going on. <laughs> There's so much going on. And like, it has some cool action and it has some fun moments. But I honestly think that this movie is like a better franchise sequel than Goblet of Fire is. Like, I feel like this movie does the work that is needed for, like, the fifth movie in a franchise over what Goblet of Fire does for, That's interesting. for itself. Um, I would agree with that. I, it does, but it, it to me, it feels so, like, meticulously plotted. Like, we're going to cut this down to fit this amount of time, and we're going to go from scene to scene to scene in a very like, linear progression without any, in my opinion art to it the way that right. Prisoner of Azkaban did or you know real style or point of view but maybe that is what this book needed it is like we said it's 700 pages so yeah, and the thing about Prisoner of Azkaban is like not only is it Alfonso Cuaron who's like an amazing filmmaker but also mm-hmm. he gets the best script of a, of a Harry Potter book there aren't a dozen new characters there's like yeah. three new characters and then five main characters that were, were already right. in the movie. He, he gets like the small scale Potter, like no earth shattering events happen in Azkaban. And that kind of makes it just more accessible as like a movie. 
it's true. This movie, you can feel like the burden of being like, all right, well, we have to keep Neville involved because we've got the revelation about his parents, even though he's not super relevant to the rest of the story. We got to introduce Luna and then we got, there's lots of stuff where it's like, this feels very perfunctory or checkboxy or out of obligation. Yeah. Creature's yeah. got to show up. So we got to do two scenes with him. So we got him for later. You know, there's a lot of that in this movie. I counted it. There's, there's six brand new characters in this movie. Wow. In addition to okay. like 27 characters <laughs> of <already>. the usual <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah which and even watching it you know just you know there are characters that show up where you're like tonks has a moment where she gets mad and her hair color changes and it's just sort of thrown in to make sure you sort of ch- again checked that box for that character but without yeah. really diving into it yeah and i guess the difference here between this and goblet of fire is like in goblet of fire they had that too but it was just like for total throwaway characters that don't show up again in this movie. Right. Like, they have all this characterization of, like, the the Bulgarians and the French <laughs> schoolgirls, and then they just you don't aren't like important to the franchise in? at all. I like the, I like the staff stomping. Yeah, yeah, staff dancing. So <laughs> insane, and you're like, what is this? Why? <laughs> so I can at least uh, appreciate Order of the Phoenix because it's, like, building the franchise a little bit. Yeah. Now, I really I like this take because although I think this is a bad movie, there is one thing that I want to talk about later that I think is really important about this film and really successful about this film. And, and I think you're actually setting it up really nicely now, which is that this movie does some really important things for the franchise that maybe yeah. aren't like don't make it a great film, but were necessary or at least important to the success of the later films. Yeah. So let's get yeah. into the book report corner, Ben. I only have one thing I want to talk about, and it's related to what we just talked about. And and Jesse, you've already mentioned his name. It's David Yates. Mm-hmm. This film introduces a new director to the franchise, David Yates. And he then becomes the Harry Potter guy. He directs all four of the final films in the main franchise. The first two Fantastic Beasts movie and the third one that's currently in production right now, I believe, or is at least in pre-production. And so, you know, he has now directed the vast majority of Harry Potter. And this is his start. He directs the Fantastic Beast movies? He does. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> what do you think his house looks like? Do you think there's just Harry Potter shit everywhere? <laughs> I mean, and the thing is, as far as films go, this is really all he's ever done. Right. He, he, he made, you know, some shorts. He went to film school and all that, but he was a TV guy. He mm-hmm. was very successful in British TV. He had a, several very successful series, including State of Play. Which I've seen, it's great. There was a shitty American film remake of it that was totally forgotten. He made a, a series called Sex Traffic, which is also really good that I've seen. But that was his milieu. He was used to working, you know, for the BBC. And then he's brought on. This is his first major feature film, and this is all he's done since. Yeah. He gets hired by David Heyman, who's a name worth noting because he is the producer of the Harry Potter films and probably deserves as much auteurship credit for the film series as anybody. And you don't really hear his name mentioned that often, but when asked why he gave the job to Yates, he said it was partly because he got tremendous performances out of the actors in his TV shows, which I can, which I agree with, but it was also because of his political streak that he made politically charged television. His quote is, this is a political film, not with a capital P, but it's about teen rebellion and the abuse of power. David has made films in the UK about politics without being heavy handed. Interesting. I think this is going to be really relevant to what I want to talk about later. And I also think it really is interesting in how that informs this movie compared to the other films in the franchise. All right, cool. Well, let's get into the movie. We open up with Harry hanging out at a playground by himself, swinging (laughs) on a swing like the emo boy he is. We panned out over these massive suburbs to then this massive empty field. Yeah. I know. This is when I thought it was signs. <laughs> he lives in the Sahara <laughs> like, Desert playground. Uh, I, I I assume without knowing for this is a fact that that is a particularly like British thing, right? Where you've got these massive cities that are beginning to expand into this historically agrarian land that really just isn't being used for farms anymore. Mm-hmm. And so you get these massive sprawling suburb complexes like you'd see outside of some like Midwest cities here in the United States, maybe. So mm, yeah. this this moment this opening moment, you know, Harry's mulling over the death of Cedric in the last movie. And then we get what was a standing ovation moment at the screening that I went to in 2007. The reveal of Dudley oh, after a so year good. a year off uh, in Goblet Fire, he didn't show up. Re- Dudley is now a poser 
2007 skater oh, the asshole. Fashion, <laughs> the fashion is so 2007. <laughs> it's so good. It was honestly one of my favorite parts. He's got a like a metal ball necklace or something and like a jersey and athletic shorts. And it's just because the last time we saw Dudley, he was Dudley. He was in his his He's fat like boy his jolly outfit. Button down mm-hmm. shirts and pink, his sweater. Uh, He's got like a bow tie or whatever. Yeah, pigtail coming out. <laughs> but Dudley has clearly been listening to like Linkin Park or something. Um because now he's now he's a badass. Voice. We don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but can we shout out Harry Melling, uh, who has somehow become the most compelling yeah. actor to to have been discovered by this series? If you haven't seen Queen's Gambit, absolutely. Queen's Gambit, I love <laughs> him in in um, Ballad of Buster Scruggs. He doesn't even speak so in that good. movie, and he's so compelling. But he's fantastic. I also thought he was good in um in Old Guard. The Netflix movie from oh, last I summer. I didn't see that one. Nice. I didn't see that one. Cool. Shout out Harry Melling. I wanted to talk about Daniel Radcliffe at this moment in time. The man himself. The man himself. Was this was this the same time as Equus or was that later? Hmm. I would have to look that up. He's like 18 or 19 because he's a couple of years. I think he's a year older than we are. So he's 18 Pres- in this. Presumably he's not doing Equus until he's 18, right? I would hope yeah, so because he showed his penis. I feel like that would have been a post Potter, but I don't know. Let's I think it was during Potter. It was during Potter, really? for sure. That's a bold choice. Yeah. No, he was making moves. 2008, so like right on okay, the cusp. Okay, so next, next year. year. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like at this point, he's kind of settled into the role just fine. You know, it's a little shaky at first. I think Azkaban's the first time he really is acting for real. Mm-hmm. He carries these movies a long way. He's in, a lo- he's in almost every scene, and he has a lot of work to do, and I think he does a pretty good job for such kind of a... You think that Harry's kind of a bland character, or or like an yeah. everyman? <laughs> He's definitely yeah. A Mary Sue. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, a Harry Sue. A Harry Sue. He definitely has a lot of like teen angst to have to deal with in a not annoying way in this film. Uh, I think he does an okay job. Yeah. But it, it's you bring up a good point, which I always think about, which is just the idea of casting somebody when they're like what eight or nine, Such a risk. and just hoping for the best Just, you yeah, know we'll put him through the like, would this series have been different if it was you know the crown style of like casting new actors each time right <laughs> as they get older? not only i don't know not only one actor but like 10 10 of them yeah. i think or i guess like six main that they got to stick with the one that always gets me is Neville, right? Because in the first uh, movie, you just need him to be comic relief. And by the time you get to the last movie, he needs to have like a complex emotional arc. And you, you better hope that that kid's up to it. He got so hot by the end. That was, that's the big reveal of the series, right? That Neville got pretty hot. Yeah, <laughs> Neville. Yeah, we love hot Neville. I'm rooting for him. Um, uh, yeah, so this, you know, there's an attack and Harry has to use magic. And then it's kind of a formula at this point. There's always this opening half hour before they go to Hogwarts. And in this case, it's Harry getting picked up by the order and getting in trouble for using a a self-defense spell against the Dementors and having to go to trial for using the spell. It's pretty intense. Which even before we even get into the the trial part, I, I just always want to uh, throw out that I, I love the the weird Dementor design of when they're sucking out your soul. They're just like sucking your face off. You know, I feel like 2007 me thought that was hilarious. I <laughs> always thought they actually face. sucked your face. Like, but in the in the movies, they kind of just like they like mush your your face gets all blurry and it like floats yeah, away. It's, just kind of getting blurry and pixelated. <laughs> it's like a really rudimentary special effect. They're like, hey, we like know how to like copy and blur. Yeah. You know, stretch yeah. and deform and blur. So let's do that. When I read the books, it was definitely like alien status. Like oh, the yeah. Dementors it was like will suck your planting face. Planting a kiss. Yeah, the kiss. The Dementor kiss. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. it's 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 interesting. It's a, it's a choice. <laughs> it's a choice. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna say this now and you guys can can kind of weigh in as we get to the film. One of the things that really struck me watching it this time that I've never noticed before is that this movie looks weirdly cheap. Yeah. The special effects in particular have not aged well. Interesting. Yeah. There, I mean, I, I kind of I noted there's some where I'm always like, yeah, sweeping shots of the castle are great. And then others we, we'll get into. But there's there's some particular CGI moments where I'm like, well, OK, <laughs> that's that's a choice. I think I always gave Harry Potter a pass. I was always like, it's Harry <laughs> Potter. Who get, Like, it's fine. It's based on a book. I never like expected it to be good CGI, like Lord of the Rings status for some reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's not based off a book. 
No, I know. I, it was just like I gave it a, a free pass. I was just a little bit surprised. And it could be that I'm setting a higher bar because this was 2007. You know, mm -hmm. we don't have fully CGI characters that often in movies at that point. But like characters like Grop and the Dementors and the Centaurs look jarringly out of place yeah, they to me. They, and like, they feel like they definitely made the choice with the centaurs this time around because they, they had closer up versions in other movies, but this time they were like, oh, let's keep them in shadow and kind of in the trees. You know, let's not let's not get too close in on their facial features because we can't do them. It is funny. You're right, Ben. It, it does look kind of cheap. And then you, you remember that this was the biggest movie of 2007. It cost $150 million, <laughs> maybe yeah. $200 million. And again, you like you said, Lord of the Rings had already happened. Obviously, that was working on a whole different scale, but... Those movies hold up. That's Peter Jackson versus David Yates, right? Like yeah, That's the difference. <laughs> this is not going to become a Lord of the Rings podcast, but one thing I, I always feel I need to mention about the Lord of the Rings movies is that the three of those films were originally budgeted together for $100 million. Really? Each individual film cost a third of that. Wow. So this movie effectively costs somewhere between four and six Lord of the Rings films. Jesus. Wow. And then yet still, when Tonks changes her nose into like a beak, it, it felt looks like, really it bad. Felt like Jim Carrey Snapchat in like, filter. like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> truly, or like the Howlers. I was like, what is this? Oh, <laughs> you can do better than this. <laughs> Knowing that, ugh, I yeah. guess the big thing here is like, it's it, like you said, Jesse. It's the symbolic second half of the Potter series because Voldemort comes back at the end of four. He's back, and now we're in war, basically. And this this half of the Potter never appealed to me as much as the first half of just like discovery and fun. And I'm curious, like, do you have a preferred side of the coin for this? Mm. Like, do you like the war more than you like the the you're a wizard, Harry? Like, I just that yeah. shit is undeniable. And the war stuff, I was always like, ugh, whatever. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> certainly now, uh, looking back, it's it's very. Violent. Um, but I, I mean, that first book, you, you just can't. Ugh, that magic of the the first moment of learning you're a wizard, to us as yeah. children at the time, <laughs> was certainly something undeniable. But I, I surprised myself that I do love when they leave school in you know in oh, the last yeah. book and are in the woods, which I, which surprised me because I'm also a big fan of just like hijinks, hijinks in at the Hogwarts. magic school. Oh, yeah. Hijinks at hijinks at Hogwarts. That's what I'm all about. Absolutely. <laughs> a big thing established in this section of the movie is the theme that adults just won't tell kids what the hell is going on. And yes. we love, that's a great millennial theme in general. <laughs> like, just, oh, you know, yeah. shit's going down. And we're like, what's happening? And the adults are like, yeah, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Don't worry. Like, uh, we grew up with like 9-11 and the war, yeah. two wars going on. We didn't even know anything about them. Yeah, let's talk about 9-11 in this <laughs> Harry Potter podcast. Let's get into it. <laughs> Climate change and all that. Like, the millennial generation is like an activist generation, right? In a way that, like, Gen X wasn't. And it is really interesting that, that you can see that here in this film. Yeah, it's, you know, all the adults in this movie are in hushed rooms talking about Voldemort and the kids. There's that scene where they are lowering the ear down the stair. Mm -hmm. They have a little ear to listen to what the adults are saying because they, they just want to know what's going on. And it comes back again and again and again. And it's certainly like a universal, you know, I, I think any, any kid of, of any generation feels that sense of like not wanting to be talked down to by adults, uh, but inevitably getting talked down to by adults. Right. Um, yeah. Even though yeah. Harry, Ron and Hermione have solved all of the problems so far in this <laughs> mm -hmm. series, and they really deserve to have a seat at the table at this point. Harry stood his own against Voldemort at the end of the second movie. He dueled him. He, he, they held the wand energy Beam. like evenly. <laughs> they passed it back and forth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they held their ground. <laughs> he, he retrieved the body of beam. Cedric from the battle. It is wild how much they expect of this child. <laughs> they they really need to step up. I always like it in the first book where Dumbledore's like, really, if you hadn't gotten involved, it would have been fine. But I'm glad that you did and that you did okay. I mean, and that's a lot of the fifth book too, right? As I, we'll, we'll get into it, but just like, yeah. if Harry had not... <laughs> gone to the ministry then all like you know Sirius right. would still be alive and... uh ben you want to talk about some casting for a second during this next section of the film we meet the order of the phoenix harry gets rescued from his home and 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 we meet a whole bunch of returning and new characters people like mad eye moody from the fourth film and lupin from the third but then also tonks and and kingsley shacklebolt and stuff like that and it's been said a million times but it's always worth pointing out that one of the series most 
incredible aspects is its cast, particularly with the adult supporting characters. It's just frankly insane when you run down the list of people that they got to be in this movie to play like a two scene role that maybe only has like one line of dialogue. It's out of control. It's crazy. We were talking not long ago about what categories we'd add to the Oscars. And you said you'd add casting. Yeah. Mm, uh, Yeah, absolutely. So in honor of that, I wanted to mention Fiona Weir, who was the casting director on this film. She was the casting director for all the Harry Potter films, starting with Goblet of Fire. And I did a quick browse of her IMDb, and there were a number of impeccably cast movies on that list that I was just like, wow, clearly she knows what she's doing. She cast Master and Commander. Oh, so good. <laughs> which just has such an incredible cast. She cast yeah. movies like Love Actually. That's you know, impressive. where you've got all these That's like British stars who are going to explode in the next two years. Yeah, wasn't that Keira Knightley's first? <laughs> she did like movies that had like lots of big stars coming together, like Invictus, which was a huge deal, where it's like, oh, Matt Damon and you know Morgan Freeman in Clint Eastwood, Everest. I was just, I was just impressed, and I wanted to shout her out. Fiona Weir cast this movie. Honorary Oscar time. Yeah, casting directors do not get nearly enough credit. Uh, do you think Harry Potter is kind of the um, the law and order of uh, of England? Like it feels like every actor of note has been in a Harry Potter film, <laughs> even for just a line, like you said. Yeah, it's and it's like a way to get those royalties, right? Where it's like, oh, oh yeah. man, you've been you have been doing the work on the stage or on TV for forty years, for thirty years, for twenty years. You are a working British actor. Go get some Harry Potter money. Yeah, get that. It's like the check. original Marvel. It's like or the MCU, yeah. just like. Yes, I'm doing Harry Potter, but I'm also doing other stuff. Pays the bills. I can also be seen on the stage and screen. Yeah. In the MCU, you don't have like an actor of the caliber of Emma Thompson showing up for two scenes and saying Playing like two crazy lines of dialogue. Tre- Trelawney. <laughs> yeah. No. It feels. I mean, it definitely feels right up Emma Thompson's alley, though. You're like, yeah, have some fun, Emma. That's great. <laughs> Any chance to see Emma and Alan Rickman on screen together too is just absolutely. Fantastic. I'm I'm a huge supporter of the fact that they only went British, like. They, they were just such snobs about it, and it paid off in spades. They got the most amazing cast of all time, and none of it feels fake at all. Yeah, I guess, was there a moment when they were considering Americans? I feel like maybe my brother went to, like, a casting call around. There was a casting call for American children. Interesting. Because wow. I remember my dad wanted to sign us up for it, but you had to be in, like, New York or Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was before the first film came out. Right, interesting. I'm so glad they went British. It adds so much. I mean, so much authenticity. Yeah, especially kids trying to do British accents. Yeah, I no mean, way. I, no offense to kids trying to do. I'm sure there's uh, American kids who can do flawless British accents, but <laughs> not me when I was a child. Absolutely not me either. Do you want to talk about the trial and specifically Cornelius Fudge? I think the most underrated or like just like underappreciated Harry Potter character. I don't know. Does anyone? I never cared about Cornelius Fudge when I was a kid. I was like, who is this uh, guy? He sucks. He sucks. And now he's the most authentic <laughs> character. Holding on to power for dear life and just, ugh. Yeah. Awful. Try- seeing enemies everywhere he looked. Um, he is a politician through and through. I think that as an adaptation, this movie suffers a little bit from having some of Fudge's character just be told to us by other characters. I, in the book, I remember him showing up more frequently. Mm. Or having more to do when he does show up so that we can see all that stuff firsthand. Interesting. I mean, I I like yeah. Robert Hardy's performance, though. I think he's pretty good as, you know, he's always like trying to smile, but he's there's something stinky going on with this guy. You can always tell. He, I think he embodies that energy really well. And they do a good job in, in that trial scene of just showing how absurd it is, you know, having the, the full, what is it, the wizen, wizengamot? Uh, the trial. wizengamot. Who? <laughs> they pronounce it differently in the movie, though, don't they? It always... Trips me up because they don't oh, pronounce it the way I pronounce it in my head. Wizen Gamut? Yeah, it's like Wizen Gamut <laughs> or something. This scene where we enter into and explore the Ministry of Magic is the thing I want to talk about more than anything else in the movie. Because I think it really speaks to what you were saying, Nat, about this setting up the rest of the franchise. And it is really the only thing that Yates is doing that I really like. This movie established an aesthetic for the Harry Potter films, where before there really wasn't one, or there was one that had changed so frequently that it hadn't been nailed down. It didn't have a unique feel yet. But the combination of design, cinematography, tone, style, really solidified itself in this movie and then going forward and became what we think of when we think of the Harry Potter movies. Mm. The way they feel, the way they look. 
Yeah. The newspaper montages. Newspaper, you know, newspaper that was him, montages. Right? <laughs> when you go to like the theme parks in Universal, I feel like it's these movies. It's not the first yeah. movie, which is sort of really pristine and clean and straight from the text. To my mind, it's it's like the Hallmark card version of Harry Potter, those first couple yeah, movies. Yeah, for sure. Here is where we get... it. Quaron starts to do it, and it's Yates who takes the ball and runs with it, this really distinct and unique aesthetic that becomes... Harry Potter's defining trademark in the face of all of the other young adult and fantasy adaptations out there. Well, and a lot of them tried, to, I think a lot of them tried to rip this off too. Yeah. It's like cool, hot kids in hoodies that live in a magical world. Like I feel like every other YA adaptation tried to look like this eventually. I really wanted to try and, and nail down what I thought this aesthetic was and why it works. And so I, I had some thoughts I want to run by you and pick your guys' brain and see, see how you react to these. She said, like, at first I was trying to come up with a way to define it or terminology. And what I came up with was corporate coal punk. Coal punk. So it's like late industrial revolution. It's not steampunk anymore, but it's been sort of like melded. It's like Edwardian England meets Thatcher's 80s mixed together. We've got brick. <laughs> we've got coal blackened skies. And we've got stodgy suits and conservative culture being represented yeah. here. And it's really interesting melding of something that feels very old but also has like the slickness of the eighties all over it. Interesting. Yeah. I like that. I like that. I see. I think it. you I need to get, it. you need to get the magic, the kind of like glossy magic in there somehow. That's, that's like my corporate angle. Right? Okay. <laughs> like everything's like, everything sort of looks like a building that was built in 1986, except it's made out of weird black bricks and everyone yeah. looks like they're wearing clothes from 1900. And they are always glossy bricks. Again, like the mystery They're is like so dark glossy. and weird, but very glossy. <laughs> I'm taking glossy in a very literal sense. Interesting. Uh, okay. And I stand by it. But I think this is more than just an, an, a unique visual signifier. And it is. Like there really hadn't been anything that looked like that before this. Yeah. And it's notable that it's here in the ministry that it's most clear when the ministry is the big new setting that is introduced in this movie. All the Hogwarts stuff, we already have sets. We already have miniatures. We're just returning to the things we've seen before. This is our new glimpse at the Wizarding World, which will then define the feel going forward. But I think it works not just because it looks cool. I think it works because it underlines some of the thematic elements of the story that are, are pretty subtle. The, the, the culture of the Wizarding World in the text of the books and the films is this really interesting conservative culture that I feel like is a very deliberate comment on the Thatcher 80s, which is when Rowling is dreaming up and writing the books. Mm, okay. I mean, just think about it. They, 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 they wear old clothes. They, they venerate old ideals. Everything is about how old it is and doing things the way it's been done. And then that gets reflected in the fact that they are xenophobic and, uh, you know, they are resistant to change. All that stuff feels, you know, very, very pointed. It's not like an accident. Yeah. Yeah. They have incredible creative power, but they don't use it to make new things. They do it to preserve old things. Again, which is why it's so disappointing that J.K. Rowling <laughs> turned out to be the ultimate conservative holding up uh, old ideals. Holding up old uh, ideals. Because, again, I mean, I, but you're right that like reading these books at the time was like, yeah, fight against, you know, the machine, fight against corporate culture, fight against, all, you know, the people trying to hold power in place. Uh, and uh, really meant a lot to people who felt on, you know, on the outside at the time, uh, kids who, who felt like loners. You know what's mm -hmm. funny though? I wrote this down that it I felt watching this movie, at least from the American perspective, that both sides, quote unquote, could see this as like their story. <laughs> like you could go on either side of the of the fence and and apply the narrative to what happens to Harry in this movie, and you could you could be like, Yeah, that is me. That's Harry's on my side. Sure. Um, which I found very amusing, mm. especially yeah. in the sense that you said, Ben, where they said, this is a political film, but not with a capital with P. With a small P. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lowercase P. Like, There's some light, like World War II imagery too. I feel like, you know, his like big poster in the ministry at the yeah, end. Yeah. The big poster in the ministry, which is both like very like 1984, like fascist imagery, but is also mm -hmm. does feel this kind of like Edwardian or maybe like World War II era British element to it. And that's the other thing. That, that I didn't mention yet, which is that it also all feels very distinctly British. Yes. Yeah. And Yates is only the second British director to direct a Harry Potter film because Chris Columbus and Alfonso Cuaron are not British. 
So it's only Mike Newell with the fourth one and now him who can bring that sensibility to it. And we talked about it already with like panning over the suburb, which to me feels like is very specific yeah, to a British perspective. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think all of that is really important and really works in this movie and then becomes the the, the standard. Yeah. Let's continue through the movie. Harry gets acquitted and he goes off to Hogwarts. I think the big takeaway from this movie, the big standout thing from this movie that I think sits in our generation's heads is Dolores Umbridge. She is the oh, yeah. standout character of this movie. She is just the one that you remember the most from this whole affair, I think. She's iconic. Imelda Staunton. She is iconic. Yeah, Imelda Staunton does such a fantastic job. And I, I will say, I think there is a difference between the, the book Dolores and the movie Dolores. Her And, you know, maybe this is just to not make it too dark and intense, though obviously it, it does go there. But hers feels very, like, that passive-aggressive, smiley, almost the original Karen, yes, uh, if you will. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is almost just more evil when she's, like, I feel like in, in the book it goes even, like, bigger evil. Is she not like that in the book? I don't even remember. What What's her deal in the book? I, she's more openly sadistic. Yeah. I, she still has this kind of, I guess it's described in the book as, as, like, this sort of little voice with the hen-hens and the, you know, the cats on, on the wall. Uh, but I feel like she gets just, like you said, more openly sadistic about it. Okay. She's also, like, dehumanized a fair amount. I remember that quite clearly from the book. They always, like, you know, describe her as looking toad-like. You know, yeah. they, they try as often as possible, try to make her sort of not seem like a person. But I wanted to talk about that because I think what makes Umbridge so interesting is she's one of the most iconic villains in the Harry Potter franchise. Mm -hmm. Every book's got a new villain, but she really stands out. And yet she is kind of distinct from them because what makes her a villain most of all is that she's a bad teacher. It's like the threat <laughs> that she represents towards their education more than yeah. anything that's the problem They're like we're gonna fail our tests <laughs> and every other villain wants to kill these kids except this one person who's just like i'm a bad teacher and i will make education bad and i will rob your children of the opportunity to learn and rowling invests that with all of her writerly skill to make her as unlikable and detestable as possible mm. It's interesting when I was watching the, because I, I also recently rewatched The Music Man, where he, like, Harold Hill comes in and his whole, like, think method of you can learn to play the trombone if you just think about it. And watching this movie, I was like, wow, it's the same, <laughs> the same method of teaching. Like, you just have to think about it. You'll be able to do it on the test. <laughs> she is Professor Harold Hill from The Music Man. Yeah, she's my Broadway the, fans out there. <laughs> she is the worst. She, uh, and we just, we, we'd mm -hmm. love to hate her back, back in the day. As a kid who was very, like, just like, I gotta study for the SATs and very, you know, like, very nerdy, I, I feel that, that sense of, like, we're gonna fail this huge test because you won't let us, you won't teach us anything. Yeah. Uh, it is such a, such an interesting threat. I'm really excited to see Imelda Staunton play the queen. It's gonna be great. And on the crown. She's gonna kill it, oh, I think. Oh, right. Yeah. Still catching up on the last season. Sharing the screen with, um, with Helena Bonham Carter, who I guess plays her sister but younger. So these British actors, they're everywhere. The other thing I wanted to talk about in this section is, is this thread of like Harry the loner. He's, he gets really like ostracized from the rest of the students. Couldn't really figure out why, I guess because the Daily Prophet's calling him a liar and everyone hates him all of a sudden. But it's not even just the Daily Prophet, right? It's like the ministry. Like it's as if the entire government was saying, like, you're a liar. Right. <laughs> and you should Listen, not be trusted. This kid in your class is a threat to the <laughs> nation's security. I mean, it's yeah. wild. Umbridge, yes, was a threat to their education, but also was, was like, abusing <laughs> Harry and was, you know, saying, like, he's a liar and, and having him cut his own hand open. And with the ministry, you know, with the whole government saying he's a liar, it's wild that, I don't know, can they sue in this world? <laughs> uh, like... You know what the other side of that is? This is the era of rendition and Guantanamo Bay and the torture report and all that. And yet in the Harry Potter universe, the government is powerless to stop this orphaned kid whose guardians hate him. Except by framing him for a crime? They can't come up with any other way to stop this kid? They don't have like secret covert hit squads? To take out this 15 year old. Or just kid? wipe his mind, like make him lose his mind. Right. Yeah, you're wizard. This is a world where you can wipe someone's memory. Hey, man, Fudge never uh, wanted to hurt anybody. 
physically. That's true. It is it is Umbridge who gets who goes to that place later on where she's like, I'll use the Cruciatus curse. Yeah. It's okay. She's Fred like a CIA agent who goes too <laughs> yeah. far. Awful. <laughs> That's when you're like, oh, okay, you're actually like a real a bad threat. Yeah, <laughs> you're so kids. The scene that I love is the first attention scene. When he's writing with mm-hmm. the quill and it's cutting into him. Her performance in that scene is really good. So good. Because mm-hmm. she's like, she's so... Yes, anything wrong? <laughs> energized by yeah. by what's happening in that moment. And you're like, holy shit, this is a lot worse than I thought. Yeah. Torture is for the torturer's benefit. <laughs> I want to talk about, uh, really quickly, Seamus Finnegan. Looking Shame. old. Sha- Looking Shamus, old. Yeah. Seamus Finnegan. <laughs> He's got a few years he's, on him at this point. He's got like um, a five o'clock shadow. Yeah. <laughs> it's that thing where they're like, well, we don't know how anyone's going to age. Yeah. We thought Daniel Radcliffe might be a little taller. He's one of those <laughs> no. old looking kids. All right. So because of Umbridge being a non-teacher, we get the big plot of this movie, which is that Harry, Ron, and Hermione start a militia. They start a student militia in order to defend themselves from the perceived threat of Voldemort. Is this movie pro Second Amendment, guys? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if Juan's in this world, oh God, yeah. This is why I was saying it could be applied to both sides. It's like, on the one hand, Voldemort is climate change. On the other hand, Voldemort is the deep state. Is it, 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 <laughs> yeah. it is terrifyingly easy how you just to use a wand to kill somebody. You should not be giving these kids. They are very <laughs> dangerous weapons, you know? Like, you can say two words and then somebody dies. Yeah, so they they decide that they have to train up to fight in a war. It does, when, on paper now, it sounds very QE, I gotta say. I mean, um, <laughs> a, a secret war that the government denies exists. Uh, or like you said, though, is it just a, is it a study group? <laughs> It's a study group. It's uh, a study group. It's a study group gone awry. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just going to say this now. They ultimately do storm a government building to take down the deep state. Um, okay. <laughs> but to, to recover oh the hidden secrets <laughs> that have been denied to the them. The hidden prophecy. Told to them in dreams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll stop on that thread. But they, oh God, they, yeah, need to, they need a place to train. They find the room of requirement, which is one of the coolest coolest elements of Hogwarts, I think. Yes. A room that will, if you are in need of something and you find the room of requirement, it will have whatever you need inside of it, which is a super cool concept. I will say that I think one thing that sucks about the room of requirement in this movie is like they don't show it off for such a cool concept. Yeah. They like don't show how cool it is. They don't even show someone find a bathroom or like find a cool room yeah. filled with like, I don't know. They they have it in the books, right? They're like one time I was in the fourth book. Dumbledore is like I found chamber pots there. Yeah, that's how he knows that Dobby is like telling the truth because he's like, oh yeah, I know Dumbledore has talked about finding this room one time too. They could have done something really cool in the movie where like they need something else besides just a I boring know. room with a dummy in it, or at least made that room look cooler. <laughs> what a weird set this is. It's too. a really weird this room set. of requirement set. Yeah. It's honestly my my main complaint throughout the film is like those cool moments like the room of requirement, like the Department of Mysteries could have been so much cooler. Yeah. And the the David Yates like dark aesthetic, I feel like somehow also stripped them of that. And you're right, it just needs to be like it's just some other cool thing. It's such a cool thing. Who doesn't want a room that appears with whatever you need? Yeah. Jesse, I'm so glad you said that. And I don't think it's just the dark aesthetic. I think it's something else Yates is doing or not doing. That in my opinion is his greatest failing as a director in all of the films of his that he made, but is particularly bad in this film and is what sinks the movie for me. What would you guys say to the statement? If I said that this movie is boring, do you agree with that? I disagree. I, I was in, I, I thought it moved along at a steady clip and I was pretty invested in the story and maybe only the last like fourth quarter. I got a little bit like what, what the fuck before the battle. Gotcha. I would kind of agree with you, Ben. I mean, it does the job it needs to do, which is cut 700 pages into two hours. But to that end, I do feel like it's such a linear, plotted out movie. And it loses. There's some of my favorite moments in the Potter series are in this book, like the Fred and George epic leaving, which I feel like lost its magic in this. It's just you know, a, the, the room of requirement. Movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like some fireworks effects and no, no speech. You know, it's just. Some of those real moments of magic and fun are like plotted out in this. So I, I was finding myself getting very bored watching the movie. And I was trying to identify why, because now I agree that like 
the pace at which things happen in this movie is very quick, right? Things don't yeah. get a lot of time because there's so much to get through. And yet I was still bored. And so I was looking for an answer and I started to notice something. And once I noticed it, I couldn't unnotice it. And next time you watch it, you will are, see Are you about too. to ruin Harry Potter for everyone? Maybe the fifth movie. <laughs> David Yates is really bad at blocking. Yes. Yeah. Almost every scene in this movie involves two characters standing, facing mm-hmm. each other, not moving, and talking. Interesting. People yes. don't do things. Even when we get into the room of requirement and they are supposed to be training, the vast majority of characters are standing still, not doing anything. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, everyone's just like walking in a straight line. And it's crazy how much that is the case in this film. The only time yeah. where it really doesn't happen, where he really starts to get creative with it, is, in my opinion, the movie's best scene, the fight between Voldemort Dumbledore and Dumbledore. Dumbledore versus Voldemort? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's, my, my, that's the best scene in the movie. For it's sure. the only time where characters are doing motivated actions that are captured on film that are like, progressing the visually told story. Otherwise it's plant and bark. Interesting. Yeah. Which I, I think I would absolutely agree with that. I think it, it also is a detriment to the performances. Cause I, I mean, for the, the, the dark greenness and like the, you know, they're growing up, they're dealing with a lot. Uh, they should be having these huge, meaningful performances. And by nature of just, like you said, the, the stand and say your line in a, you know, two person shot, it just forces the actors to be a little bit more, contained in their performance um on top of everything else part of what makes the third movie so good is that the kids are really good in it and you could tell it's because quaron is tapped into the full the full suite of directing mm-hmm. and yeah. how all yeah. of those things relate to each other maybe i just needed yeah. a i needed a palate cleanser from goblet of fire which is <laughs> yeah. such a mess that, goblet of fire is my least favorite film it's so insane. i do like this yeah. one more than goblet of it's fire it's insane how crazy that <laughs> it's movie just is. wild to that effect i'd like to talk quickly about the two pretty random like social plot threads that Harry experiences in this movie, which almost seem like they should have been combined, and that's his romance with Cho and his weird non-friendship with Luna. Two girls that God. he just starts talking to. If there wasn't a book, you would just combine them. <laughs> yeah, it makes the most sense. He should fall in love with Luna yeah. or have a I weird fully- relationship. With Luna. I will disagree with because I, I do love that. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I totally see the point and, you, and you're certainly not the first to say that. I, what I love in the book about Luna is that she is like, that it is just a friend. She's just <laughs> a friend. Just, like, I just know. It's just weird friend. It's honestly then just cut out. Ch- Why does he have to make out with Cho who has no character? She has nothing. I know. It's really disappointing. Well, that, that's the thing. Is they really do, you know, they they do show. I, and also like even Luna's character. They, they, they definitely don't dig deep into either of those characters. No. And it, it is it is like what Ben was saying where they just are like talking at each other and it's really, yeah. really boring. Yeah. I do want to say Ivana Lynch's Luna Lovegood I think is is a fantastic portrayal. I, I think she's, she's so fun with the role. And that character is so important to so many people. Yeah, I don't want to undercut that, but this is, in the notes I called it a box checking, right? Where it's yeah. like the movie mm-hmm. is obligated to include X, Y, and Z and it yeah. can't really mess with them. If you were writing this from scratch, there would be one character and it would be the primary non Ron and Hermione relationship Harry has throughout the film because you just don't yeah. have space for two. And they're already, I guess they, they must've felt like, Oh, we're already cutting down. Uh, Cause there's the whole, the person who they have Cho sort of betray by force the Dumbledore, you know, Dumbledore's army in the movie. But in the, in the book, it's that she brings her friend Marietta Edgecombe along. I totally understand cutting that. Cause it's just, you know, another new character that we never meet again. It's really in the doing her a disservice though. It's like, here's this person with no yeah. personality who's, fucking betrayed Dumbledore's army <laughs> like yeah <laughs> you're just like oh uh, Cho I know she she should have been given more for sure the, the one cool thing about the Luna Harry thing is like this whole movie thematically is Harry going from being all alone starts the movie completely alone in his own mind and at the end he's mm-hmm. got a motley group of friends. He's marching up the stairs with a line of students. With his militia. His, his <laughs> armed militia. It felt like such a face frame moment. We have something Voldemort doesn't have. Yeah. Friendship. Whatever. We met on something the message to fight boards. For? What does he something say? To fight for. Oh, something man. To fight yeah, for no, this is. does not look good in the age of Q and on. Okay. <laughs> it really does. Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, yeah. next up, I wanted to really 
briefly, because the movie gives them just as much respect as we're about to give them, talk about Ron and Hermione. They have nothing to do in this oh movie. Oh my God, they have nothing. You could cut these characters from the movie and it would be a better movie, which again, part of the problem. We love them though. We love to see them. I think they get more to do in the last three movies. Right? Yeah. They definitely do. Okay. They definitely do. But this is just, they don't get shit. I really noticed that, this this watch. I was just like, yeah, they're kind of there. They occasionally say lines, but really not. I think Emma Watson brought her all, though. I think she did a really bang up job. She she takes over the screen when she's on there, even though she's not actually doing anything. She does. That's funny. I think this is the, her worst acting performance in all the films. Interesting. I will say, I think it, it is the first time she starts to, she, there's still a lot of eyebrow acting. And I say that as somebody who also does a lot of eyebrow acting, who has eyebrows that uh, contain a lot of emotion and move a lot. But she's she's starting to calm down. But have you noticed that? Wait, was she in in the first oh, couple in the movies? Oh, the first movies. Oh my god. Yeah, it's a lot of Harry. You know, yeah. eyebrows oh, yeah. go up on each line. <laughs> we love it. What what I think I struggle with it in this film is that I feel like she is playing an emotional intensity that usually actually isn't in the scene. It might be in the subtext mm. of the scene, or it might be in the book scene. But in the movie scene, the characters are at like a four and she's at a seven interesting maybe that's why i liked her she just stood out more <laughs> could be she's like i'm bringing some stakes to this <laughs> even while we're all just standing in our scene blocked the way we are <laughs> i guess rupert grint should i just say his name rupert grint <laughs> he is in this movie he's, he's the third scene. build or he's the second build god bless rupert grint let's move on to the other super memorable part of this movie which is umbridge's reign of terror she takes over the school Filch is a total bootlicker. He loves it. He's oh just my God. hamming it up. David Bradley just hamming it up all over the place. The comedic moments of Filch. I definitely wrote that down as a note. It was just like seeing him eating a sandwich outside the room of requirement. Just, that guy, he, yeah, he looked milking. out in a in a cast of just all these character actors. Like that guy got the lion's he share the fun. of the fun, yeah. cool stuff in this movie. He's so blessed. He did. Filch. Except doesn't all this stuff like suck? So, am I it's fine. the only one here who finds this all really annoying and kind of like rude to the Filch character? Who, granted, is not like like a genius in the books, but like the movie has such a low opinion of him and of my sense of humor. No, I didn't yeah, mind do, it. Do you think the books have a higher opinion of Filch? <laughs> I think they think he's sadder. He's like a sad old mm. man, and in this, he's just an evil old man. He's a goofy, yeah, <laughs> henchman type. Do you also? I also really felt in this watch, and I and I have to go back and see if I think this is the first movie that really does this. Is these like montages? I don't know if this is like a <laughs> yeah, 2007 the montage. thing. So montage-y, this movie. There's so many montages. I spent like the you know Umbridge taking over. There's like all the dream sequence montages. There, there's just like montage. Episodes. All the newspapers are also technically montages. Montage, absolutely. Um, I don't mind it. Teaching DA lessons. I mean, I guess it's like, again, how you get 700 pages into two hours and 20 minutes or whatever, but. Here's the problem I have with the montages. It's the score. Yeah, it's pretty goofball. I really (laughs) don't like the score to this movie. It's Nicholas Hooper Mm. is the composer. Mm. Obviously, the John Williams themes are iconic and brilliant. And when they incorporate those, it's usually pretty good. But just kind of like the montage music is tedious and annoying and completely (laughs) devoid of emotion for me yeah yeah it is it is a little devoid of emotion but like i don't know i just kind of like the story that this this lady takes over the whole school and like it wins me over (laughs) even though it's not a good movie i just enjoy the whole like i love that he puts all the rules seeing the all of her stupid rules she's making on that gigantic wall i don't know there's just something about it that i i liked it it is a lot of fun it's fun yeah it's it's taking this very dark subject and like just making it really stupid and goofy and i I kind of admire it for that. One other filch moment uh, in this like whole fun, weird montage that I just made me think of, not to get us off track, but the physics of, of the paintings. Because at one point he like picks up a painting and kind of like holds it to the side and the people sort of shake out like an etch Yeah, they all fall. <laughs> Yeah, it's very funny. And I was like, wow, is that what happens when you pick up the paintings? Anyway, Filch is just having fun. <laughs> I remember that moment, but mostly because I was noticing how bad the painting effect looked. <laughs> how, like, obviously just like, CGI. like just placed on there it was. And yeah, like we mentioned before, there's Fred and George's act of rebellion, which is such a great moment in the books. Ugh. And in this, it does suck. It's like nothing happens. Oh, my God. 
It's honestly one of my favorite scenes in the book. It's so epic. And there you also have cut from the movies. Uh, I think I think he showed up in the first one, but was cut for time. But you have the Peeves character cut. Uh, and it's one of my favorite lines is when Fred and George are leaving and they turn back and they say, give her hell from us, Peeves. <laughs> and like he gives a salute to them, you know, which is the only time he does that to a student. I remember reading that and being like, Hell yeah, that was awesome. Oh, yeah. And in this Hell movie, yeah. it sucks. <laughs> it's so lame in this oh, movie. Oh, it sucks. There's also the moment where the, the dragon fireworks has the fangs on the side of the screen. It just felt very 2007. Ugh. Where you're like inside the mouth of the dragon. Yeah. The teeth are on the... It's no good. You're in like 3D mode. I think a big problem with it, again, is the score. I think this music cue <laughs> yeah. is like, basically the music is saying, this is just doesn't matter. This is just like a fun little lilty thing. This isn't a huge moment of rebellion. This won't matter to Umbridge's reign. This is just a little diversion from everything else that's been happening. Yeah. That's what the totally music feels yeah, that what was it? I it's feel like this is the music where I kind of went like, I was like, it's like Riverdance. Yeah, it's like Riverdance. <laughs> 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 what the hell? Like, what is this? Yeah, it just doesn't feel uh, like, this. yeah, it doesn't feel big enough. It's super, and she's just like got like some smoke on her face and you're just like, she'll be fine. She'll wipe it off and they're expelled. No, no biggie. <laughs> We're going to fast forward through a lot of, a lot of rigmarole in this movie where they go to the forest and they, they get rid of Umbridge. It's it's all... We definitely we see CGI Grop. Yeah, and Hagrid's got his moment because you gotta have Hagrid. One of the worst shot action moments in this movie is when Grop picks up Umbridge and the centaurs kind of just jump around his feet and don't do anything. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not good. And then he's like, oh, okay. I will admit it is not good. Uh, this is where I was like, this is bad. It was really seeing Grop <laughs> side by side with Hagrid for me, where you have like the real actor <laughs> and then this like CGI monstrous thing <laughs> that just felt out of place. But then it's the big ending. Dumbledore's army is like, we got to go to the ministry because Harry has these dreams where he's in Voldemort's head and he sees Sirius, who's a character in this movie. He gets attacked. So they more or less have to go to the ministry to, to find Sirius and help him out. And like, they know mm-hmm. it's a trap, but they go anyway. And then you yeah. have your big finale, your big, the prophecy library, which oh. is pretty lame. I got to say. Well, I got to say, and it just it feels like they could have, um, you know, I understand that the only person who can retrieve the prophecy is the person who the prophecy is about. But then like a simple spell just knocks them all to the ground. Like they got to store these (laughs) glass balls, thousands of glass balls in some kind of better space. It's crazy that in the book, this is like the series of protracted set pieces involving all kinds of really interesting ideas that Rowling has brewed up for what the magical mysteries are. And then in the movie, it boils down to the kids running while the shells fall. And that's and that's it. Well, and it looks so, I mean, truly, again, like the Room of Requirement, the Department of Mysteries in the book, you've got the brain room with like a tank full of brains that attack Ron. You've got that time room. The baby had a death eater. jar. The baby had a death eater. And in in this, it's just like. It's a bunch of crystal uh, balls on a shelf. With dark lighting. And yeah, exactly. And they don't even do anything interesting with them. They just fall. The movie doesn't do a good job of explaining what this shit even is. It's like, oh, yeah, who no. cares about a prophecy? I know there's like one scene with Tre- Trelawney, and it, but like it flies over your head. You're just like, what are they doing? This has no stakes other than the, the immediate danger. If you had not read the books. You're screwed. If you had not You're read not, the books, you would be lost. You're screwed. Yeah, it comes off as super MacGuffin-y. I will say also the the dream sequences throughout the movie, which are ostensibly to try and like give you an idea, and obviously they're very important in the book, but the dream sequences feel so, like again, very 2000s. They're all kind of tinged green and yellow, like it's like the trailer for Domino or Snatch. Yeah. But this one is the shot of Voldemort behind like the cloud background that looks like a music video from 2002. Yeah. It looks He's like, like yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, totally. And there's one where Harry's looking in the mirror and he sees him, but as Voldemort, so in this like button down sweater. Voldemort in this yeah. black suit at platform nine and three quarters. There's some really goofy Voldemort imagery in this movie. There is, there is. Could make some good music videos for sure. You got the wizard fight. People love this shit. They love this wizard fight. And I'm kind of like, man, this is nothing compared to Gandalf and Saruman fighting for like two minutes in the first Lord of the Rings. Like, 
the coolest wizard fight of all time with no that CGI. It's just, just two old guys mm-hmm. throwing themselves Dude around the throwing, room. And like, yeah, people love... <laughs> so good. Like, people are always like, oh, I love the wizard fight at the end of this one. And I'm like, it's fine. There's like one sweeping epic shot of people casting spells and I don't know. It doesn't do it for You're me. You're talking about the wizard fight pre Pre Voldemort. Yeah, when when it's the yeah, epic yeah, yeah. Avengers wizard fight. Around the archway. Fight. Yeah. It definitely is just kind of point and wands and running and you know they've got the the smoke death eater masks are kind of I like cool, those. I like that they all have different masks. I do like those. Yeah, and you got Bellatrix She's crazy. The Death Eater design always reminds me of that sketch, uh, like, are, you know, are, are we the baddies? Because it's just so, you're like, how could you be wearing that mask and not be like, oh, this doesn't do feel great. Really <laughs> I mean, maybe Harry should have, like, worn a, a camera so that we could catch Lucius Malfoy, like, in the act. He's he's yeah. pretty, like, <laughs> on. Taking his mask he's, off. He's totally right there being a Death Eater, but he doesn't get, like, arrested or in trouble or anything, right? He's, he, he keeps does on in the going. books. Oh. Does he? Okay, I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, they all get caught by Dumbledore right then. Is he, like, in prison in the next one? He or? gets broken out. Okay. Because it's of, yeah. Got it. I, I, want, I want to say something about this, because I agree. I think this wizard fight is pretty lame. It just, it lacks imagination. Yeah. I think that mm-hmm. with all of the fantasy knockoff movies that came out in the wake of Lord of the Rings and the first few Harry Potter films, consistently what the problem is, is that they're just, the director doesn't have the imagination to sustain the fantasy elements beyond the design stage. Mm. They can get it through design. Mm-hmm. They can get a, a visual artist to, to p- draw them a cool picture of something. But when it comes time to actually incorporate that into the world of the scene, into the action that's happening, they just run out of steam because there's someone like David Yates who's making political thrillers on TV and is now being asked to imagine what it looks like when 20 wizards are fighting and all he can <laughs> come up with is different color sparks going at each other. Yeah. And it's lame. You got to be invested. You got to want to see a wizard fight. But it's not just him. This yeah. happens all the time. I mean, it's my big complaint yeah. of the first Doctor Strange movie is that all of the mm-hmm. magic fights in that turn into crystal spear versus glowy gold rope. Like that's all they can come up with. Yeah, that's probably what I would do if I had to do it. Beams of energy. Yeah, I, yeah. I like that. Sending beams of energy back at each other. <laughs> um, I, we, we mentioned Bellatrix. She's there. She doesn't have much to do. She's just nuts. Um, She's setting up for later movies. Yeah. and she Helena is always always fantastic. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in the role. But the big deal here is that Sirius Black dies, and mm-hmm. man, I, I watched all. I watched the entire Sirius Black saga. You did. Leading up to this, beginning with, to end, three, right, four, yeah. and five. And like three, oh my God, three is such a good movie and like really spoke to me this time because, you know, I I suffered my own personal loss. I lost my father when I was a, at a young age and three is all about how Harry's like coming to terms with that. And like, he like thinks he saw his own dad as the person who cast his Patronus and like by the end of the movie, he realizes like, no, it was you. But like, it's all about how your, your parents kind of live on through you and through other people. And that's why the serious bond is so important because he's the one connection that he actually has to his dad that isn't Lupin because Lupin's like a weirdo. Um, <laughs> like, Poor Lupin. Yeah. Sirius is like the one cool guy that is that actual connection. And like, it's tragic when he dies in the books, in the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the movie um, when he dies. And also like just in four and five in general, like, I feel like they shit the bed with this relationship. They just didn't yeah. nail it. They didn't nail that like rock star aspect of Sirius Black that he needed to be Harry's like number one guy. Like right. they just don't get that across well enough. They don't have yeah. things like, you know, when Harry's threatened with expulsion, Sirius being like, you can come live with me. And and then like in, mm-hmm. at Christmas when they go hang out at Sirius's house. They needed like, scenes Sirius with them there. hanging out and just yeah. bonding. It, and it just yeah. doesn't hit when he dies. You're just like, okay. And that whole, I mean, there's that great tension in the books between uh, between Lupin and Sirius where Lupin's like, you're treating him like he's James. You're treating him like your school pal. And, and you know, that sort of responsibility that, you know, Sirius is this this godfather figure. But he does have a kind of a, a very close, a very, very close relationship with Harry, obviously, that does kind of cross the boundaries of like, are you my godfather? Are you my like best friend? Right. Or are we, you know? And I, th- those layers are so great. And we yeah, we lose all yeah. of that in, in the movie. The movie tries to have it there, like where oh, Gary Oldman calls him James during this fight. 
Not but enough. Yates doesn't do anything with it. He shoots it in a yeah. wide. But like, imagine if the only thing in this movie that was different was he says that we cut to a close up of Daniel Radcliffe hearing it, understanding it. We cut back to Gary Oldman. He looks back, realizes what he said. They share a moment where yeah. they're like, wow, what we have that? this relationship. Mm-hmm. And then Gary Oldman dies. Even that is all you need to do to make this scene better. Uh, yeah, you're right. In, in the books, there uh, there's so much more of like Sirius reaching out, wanting to help, and you know you have that sort of one fire moment where his Ugh. face is in the fire. Which and speaking bad, of this again, movie looking cheap, bad CGI. In the fourth movie, they do this thing where they like oh put him in the embers, yeah. and it's like kind of cool. And then they and cheaped out. <laughs> Here they just project like, it on yeah, the just flame. Overlay yeah, it over. What the hell? <laughs> I know. They th- oh. and like that is such a cool relationship and like really gets you through the middle section of the whole Harry Potter saga. And they yeah. just fucked it up so badly. <laughs> they fucked it up so bad. You know, the other part of the book that doesn't make it into the films and I think is really important is the like it, him being so cooped up at 12 Grimald sure. place and also like not having respect for creature which is then kind of and sort of being this complicated figure that looms large in Harry's mind, but also has his faults and has his like anger issues and uh, and feels cooped up and, and wants to break out and wants to go to the ministry to help. You don't really get any of that. You don't see him, you know, feeling so at odds that Snape is going out and doing yeah. things and he's stuck, uh, you know, at home. It adds such a complexity to the serious character mm. that you just miss. You just miss. The movie really put cool. all of its stock in making you hate Umbridge and it didn't put yeah. any stock in getting you to love Sirius. Get rid of like half of Filch being a doofus outside the room of requirement <laughs> and put in one scene with Sirius. Truly. I do remember, just to say it, in, in middle school, I remember the moment when, um, I think it was in middle school or maybe high school, when, when Sirius dies uh, in, in the books. And one of, my, one of my closest friends, Natalie, had you know read in uh, like 10 minutes, you know read, read the whole book uh, and knew what, what happened. And just the next day in school was like, wearing all oh, black. It was just like, and I was like, don't tell me, I'm not there yet. <laughs> like, she was like, oh, just for a week, yeah. I was just dressed in, <sighs> dressed in mourning. <laughs> it's intense. The only other thing I really wanted to talk about is Voldemort. He fights Dumbledore. He is taunting Harry. And I don't know, how do you guys feel about Ray Fiennes as Voldemort? I love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As as Voldemort or just as in general? Voldemort. Is that a general I statement? think his take on Voldemort is endlessly entertaining in a way that that character could easily have not been and is like a high point in the later films. The, my favorite acting choice in this entire movie is during the fight when he casts his big final spell, he puts both arms over his head and he lets the sleeves of his robe fall down so you can see his skinny white arms. And he's just standing there and he's like, I ah. did, I did. Play. I was like, <laughs> his arms are so skinny in that moment. <laughs> he's just a little guy. It's, 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 yeah, it's camp and it's silly in some respects, but it also lingers in my memory in a way that much of these film fails to. I, I would agree that I, I, I do love his performance, I think it can get very goofy at times. It can definitely get campy. Uh, particularly, like, I, you know, just thinking about, uh, you know, again, yeah, him raising his arms up. And then, like, in the later films when he hugs Draco, it's so awkward and weird. And I, weird I guess guy. maybe my problem, oh, just, just yeah, just weird guy being kind of weird. I think my, my main problem with the, with the Voldemort portrayal is, like, him disappearing into weird little pieces at the end. And, and like, the, I don't know, the choice of, they just, they really do, ugh, oh, I don't know. Him, his voice, I guess it, it works for me. It works. There's parts where I'm like, okay, this is a little goofier than evil. Yeah. Um, and I, I would like it to be scarier. I'm personally a, a less is more kind of guy. Like, less Voldemort, the better. Like, I love my Voldemort yeah. in the first one where he's just a weird head. Back of the head. You know, you yeah. know what it is to me? He's like Gary Oldman in The Fifth Element. He's like Jean-Baptiste Emmanuel Zerg. Uh, I love Zerg way more than I love Voldemort. <laughs> Voldemort's just all, he, he's the boss. Zerg is just a loser underling to some other. Mm. Voldemort is if the the big black evil, <laughs> planet, evil planet was a human was, being. I, I get you. I don't know. I just, <laughs> it adds just this fun other dimension. Yeah. I do think, Nat, you're totally right, though, that like, the more we see of it, and and certainly this happens in not to bring up signs. Again, I don't <laughs> we signs love signs. Brain. <laughs> we love signs. Uh, but you once know, you see the, the you're, I feel like once you see the aliens, it's not as scary. Yeah. Um, and I will say, I think there is. It's a choice. Like I certainly, you know, Voldemort does have. He is just 
a man at the end of the day who has like completely destroyed his soul and turned into a snake uh, <laughs> somehow because that's how souls work. <laughs> but, you know, he is just a man. So I, I, I do enjoy seeing some of the like goof. But I but I don't want it to go into goofiness. So, yeah, when it when it goes into goofy, I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> I want him to be a little more loving of his minions. We'll, we'll He's such an asshole mm. to everyone. I still buy him in this fight, right? Like, it's not like he feels entirely yes. disconnected from it. So what I'm saying yeah. is it's not like he's, like, making fun of the material with his performance. Yeah, I, I mean, I love, again, the fight is certainly one of my, if not my, my favorite scene in the, in the movie, certainly. I will point out that this big dramatic action scene ends with people standing around doing nothing. Like, that's, that's where the scene climaxes, is with Dumbledore standing over the possessed body of this very important child and doing nothing, just standing yeah. there. Adults are very useless again and again. So, Ugh. yeah, I think we covered everything. Um, the movie kind of <laughs> ends. He wakes up in the hospital or something, and then... Yeah, it, well, how does that... He's he's back at, at Hogwarts. There's the Luna scene with the shoes hanging. There's the Luna scene. There's some goodbyes. There's some farewells, and it ends like every other Harry Potter movie. He, uh, getting on the train home, and... He's learned his lesson. Yeah. He's made new friends. And it's so beautiful. Another year. And I guess I will say, like, the, the other thing that does happen at the end of the movie is is this scene between Dumbledore and Harry. I think it's back at Hogwarts where he's sort of explaining the prophecy. But again, as we said before, it's explained in such, uh, like, the, the most black and white terms of, like, neither can live, you know, while the other uh, survives. I, you know, and, and instead of getting into the fun bits of, like, of Neville and as being this other and him being chosen for this because Voldemort chose him. Um, I know it's the nitty gritty of prophecy that we, you know, certainly don't have time for. They're, they're on a schedule. So let's talk about Legacy. This movie had a budget of $150 million and it came out on July 11th, 2007, nine days before the final book. It has a five day worldwide opening, $333 million. In the United States and Canada, every single midnight screening was sold out. There were 2,311 midnight screenings. Every single one was sold out. Domestically, it made $292 million, and worldwide, it made $942 million, just shy of a billion. It was the fifth highest grossing film of the year domestically and second highest grossing film worldwide in 2007. Not too bad. Not too bad. Um, it's in good company within the top five with all three of our threequel spectacular movies. Shrek 3, Spidey 3, and Pirates 3. So quite a year for sequels, 2007. I wanted to quickly talk about some uh, Harry Potter knockoffs. I feel like they figured out somewhere along the way that it's not about the fantasy as much as it is about, like, the hot teens being like vaguely sexy and like just being in a fantasy world. But like, it's more about the, the, the teeniness than it is about like the golden compass. I think like... that's just cause the creators couldn't sustain the creative vision. Well, yeah, sure. It's like whatever sells, right? Like, is that specifically twilight or? Well, that... I just, am looking at like what was popular before like Harry Potter five, which is, I feel like is when they went full tilt, like, Teens. Uh, there's in the Chronicles of Narnia. Chronicles of Narnia, which couple. failed. And, Golden um, Compass, which fails. Golden yeah. Compass. Yeah. yeah, and they were like, what are we doing wrong? We're just doing these big budget fantasy movies. It should work. And then it's like, no, it's about the sex and like the the <laughs> hot teens, not about the, <laughs> the monsters. Or yeah. you need a generationally talented director with, you know, tremendous respect and love for the work and a firm grasp of all of the tools in their filmmaking toolbox right. which you can't always get you can't always get it's way easier to just be like edward and bella <laughs> i mean again the only other franchise that was like my franchise was lord of the rings my my aim screen name was hobbit nyc oh, I I had a, live, a live journal of the same name <laughs> oh, yeah. so yeah anyway yeah. i just thought that was an interest i like your theory though then that it's like they just don't have the talent to do that <laughs> i mean it's and it's like a different skill set right like you you don't want that for the person who's going to make the political thriller TV show. Mm -hmm. Real quick, we'll do our 2007 themes. I found two. I think one was Corrupt Institutions. We, we've seen that in almost every movie that we've covered. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really, really present here. The Ministry of Magic is 
more crooked than a corkscrew. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, and uh, the other thing is paranoia and an existential threat to our safety. It's really in this movie. Matt, could you argue that like Umbridge in charge of the school is Quagmire again? No, I don't think so. I think that's more institutional corruption. Is okay. she Cheney to <laughs> Fudge's <Yeah>. Bush? <laughs> the, I, we always say Quagmire, but I feel like this movie is not really a quagmire things are happening mm. in this movie things are constantly changing the one yeah. that came to mind for me also other than those two which i think are really good particularly institutional corruption which like this is a poster child movie for is um the the fun conspiracies are back from transformers the secret world in that episode when i was describing this kind of take on conspiracy theories where they were no longer threatening but were actually about this cool thing that you that was just behind the corner uh, and I, I named like National Treasure as an example. The best example is Harry Potter. I don't know how I never thought of that. Platform nine and three quarters. Like that's exactly what I'm talking about. Between these two boring regular train platforms, there's a magic train platform yeah. that only some people know about. Wait, can you explain? So what, that is 2007 specific because... So in Transformers, we noticed that like there's this over-explained moment in the film where they're like, guess what? The Hoover Dam was actually built to hide a Transformer. And you're like, well, that was probably uh, unnecessary. It's really interesting that you chose to make a point of like being like, hey, you know that thing you know about? Actually, it's got a secret other purpose, right. which immediately reminded me of National Treasure in particular. But just this feeling I had during that era of there being lots of media that was about the secret world behind the real world. The yeah. Hellboy. Yeah. The, the, you know, I don't even know what else it was. But it was a real change from like the way conspiracies were represented in, say, the 70s in this post Watergate era where conspiracies were often mundane, but very like frighteningly monolithic, you know, it was the insidious actions of powerful men. And now they're like, Oh, but it's actually a fun club that you get to be a part of. <laughs> yeah. Conspiracy club. Just like, no, never mind. <laughs> uh... <laughs> just like Dan in real life. Like the same era. <laughs> Can I just, Oh man. No, I already said it. Basically. I, I love that that Harry is Q. <laughs> okay. That's what we've taken is, away. Wait, is right? Trelawney Q? I guess so. I mean, listen, now, again, you talk about the legacy of these books. If uh, J.K. Rowling has tarnished the legacy insofar as she has, then it, it makes sense to read it back in that lens. <laughs> I gotta do, I, I'm like so out of the loop. All I know is that she just says stupid things like every two months or something, but I haven't gone, I'll go full deep well, dive after this. She just has a very regressive and, 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 Ignorant view of transgender rights. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she feels as though she needs to use her insanely huge use platform to speak about it. Use her giant Great. platform Great. and all her wealth and power okay. to say things JK. that are terrible. <laughs> well, with that. <laughs> Overall, Harry goes from loner to leader. I was pleasantly surprised. I wasn't trying to, you know, God. fast forward this movie. What if somebody wrote a sweet, glam rock song called loner to leader and that played mm. under the montages Ooh. instead of the terrible listen the bring it stars. back to yeah the wizard rock bands that give yes! it a chance <laughs> they were playing they're playing the library circuit <laughs> there's one scene in this movie where harry's standing on a bridge and he's talking about dealing with umbridge or something and he actually says i tried so hard he doesn't say I got so far, but in the end. But then he says, <laughs> it, doesn't even it doesn't even matter. And I was no. like, one thing. I don't know why. <laughs> doesn't it? Uh, oh, so incredible. incredible. Quite the energy, I think. That that's, I think that's the energy that this movie's kind of operating on. Yeah. Okay. We're going to plug our next episode. But before we do, Jesse, is there anything that you wanted to plug personally? Any like social media projects, fun stuff you want people to see online? Oh boy. Um yeah, well, you can follow me on social media. Uh I'm at uh oh, what am I? I'm at Jess Canizaro on Twitter and at Jesse Canizaro on Instagram. Uh and those are long in Italian last names, so uh two I, N's, I two Z's, one R. Yeah, look at that. We've known <laughs> each other since we were five. Um but um yeah, have have a have a web series coming out soon. I'll uh, I'll pass that along to you when uh, when it's out. Oh, sweet. Okay, cool. <laughs> thank you for coming on. It was yeah, a real pleasure you. to have you. Yeah. Oh, please. You know, uh, again, Harry Potter is uh, it's a uh, it was so important to me um, in in that that era growing up. It was a lot of fun to talk about. I feel weird only talking about five. Like, what are we doing? Like, I know. <laughs> so random. But it's 2007. We got to stick with the rules. Next week, 
we are going to be doing, like I said before, the threequel spectacular. We're, re- we're going to be covering Pirates 3, Spider-Man 3, and Shrek 3. Did I see Shrek 3? Wow. Yeah, it's going to be a shit show. I'm really excited. <laughs> we're going to have a special guest for that one as well. we got another great guest coming on. It's going to be nuts. So check it out. Watch those movies. You can watch... Um, Pirates on Disney Plus. You can watch Spider Man on Stars, and you can watch Shrek. You you gotta rent Shrek. You gotta spend money on Shrek. But you know what? You probably watched all these movies back in two thousand seven, and just let us watch them again for you because it's not worth it. It's true. Life's too it's short. true. Once again, BTTM Pod on Instagram, Twitter, and on TikTok, and BTTM Pod at Gmail dot com. You can also follow Ben and I on Letterboxd, the social media platform for film lovers. You can find me. Nat McGee, N-A-T-M-A-G-E-E, and Hain101. We're on there. And yeah, please give us a five-star review if you if you can find the time while you're out there looking for horcruxes. If you do, we'll read it out on the show. Yeah, make Ben say something funny. Make him... <laughs> you can <laughs> write whatever you want, and I will say it as long as it isn't, like, hateful, because we are ex- rated explicit. You want to put, you know, curse words in there? It's fine with me. Well, you want me to make you say really something stupid? Pouring ourselves out here. <laughs> He's contractually obligated to say anything you I read. just I won't say anything that's hateful towards a person or group of people. Hateful to animals? Put it in there. I'll say it. Wow. <laughs> no. Go in there. All right. Damn. If you just want to be like, oh, fuck manatees. I hate manatees. I'll, I'll do it. I'll say it. But you have to give a reason why. You can't just say that. <laughs> this is a, such a slippery slope for, <laughs> for this podcast. All right. Thanks again, Jesse, for coming on. For Back to the Movies, this has been Nat. I'm Ben. And we'll see you next week when we go back to the movies. Oh my god. I do I watch Harry Potter 6 now or do I leave it in the dust? I don't know. Watch yeah. 3 again if you really it's need to watch three it. Was, uh, three was I'll finish that at some point. I'll just do it. It's, it's gonna be a lot of work now. <laughs>